Welcome back to the Controversy Corner, Boils and Ghouls. In this series, we examine lawsuits, frauds, and other unsavory events having to do with the comic book industry. Perhaps the best and worst thing about comic books are the fans. Now don't get me wrong, obviously, I'm a fan myself. Most of us love comics and the people that make them. We seem to be a generally caring, trusting, and fairly compassionate bunch. We also seem to be able to mobilize and pull together quite a bit quicker than a lot of other fan bases. This is wonderfully exemplified by the amount of professional artists willing to donate their work to charity projects or stuff like the Hero Initiative or the Comic Book Legal Defense Fund. Likewise, comic fans are just as quick to turn around and spend their hard-earned dollars purchasing these efforts showing time and time again why I love this medium so much. This sense of community and camaraderie is without a doubt one of the best things about comics in my opinion. The other side though, the toxic side to fandom that you hear so much about these days, the fanaticism, the obsession, the inexplicable anger. Sadly, those are all too real parts of the comic book fandom as well. And as wonderful as some folks can be, I'll say this, if hundreds of people will show up to support someone and help them out, Thousands will show up to join in a good old-fashioned beatdown or just sit back with popcorn and watch the bloodbath. Few other professions outside of Hollywood face the level of scrutiny and critical attention from fans as comic book creators do, and fans' opinions can change quickly. While it's wonderful when fans mobilize so quickly when it comes to helping out members of the comic community, not many other fan communities are capable of going on a full-blown war path like comic fans, and especially not as quickly. But what happens when someone who's not famous finds themselves unwillingly thrust into the public eye for appropriating other people's work. What happens when the throngs of fans amass at your door with pitchforks and torches and you don't have any level of clout in the industry to protect you? What if it turned out that you'd never actually drawn or done anything that you'd claimed? Well, that's the subject of tonight's twisted tale. Shrouded in a veil of lies and mystery tonight, we'll be uncovering the truths and fictions about the epic rise and fall of one of comics' most infamous reprobates and famous art thieves, Robert Granito. So kick back and enjoy another tasty tidbit of tawdry industry trivia and a little video essay I like to call Robert Granito's Guide to Success. Remember, if you enjoy these videos, think about hitting that like button, get in the comment section below, and if you really enjoy what you see, make sure you hog smash that subscribe button. If you feel like you're in a position to help the channel grow, think about using the link in the description below to sign up for my Patreon page. For as little as $3 a month, you get access to tons of behind the scenes posts, updates, exclusive content like uncut interviews, and you can even get your name in the credits. You can also sign up for membership right here on YouTube, or use the Ko-Fi links to make one-time donations to the channel. If that's not enough, you can even pick up your very own jerk comic shirts like the ones you see on the screen. But now, let's get into it. Robert Granito comes from humble or not so humble beginnings. While it's been revealed that virtually nothing from his resume was actually true, at first glance, Granito seemed to have accomplished a great deal during his time in the industry by the point he'd become a staple at conventions across the nation where he peddled his prints and paintings. With credits that included work on Batman the Animated Series directly under Bruce Timm, to cover work on both Spider-Man and Iron Man, as well as collaborations with Dwayne McDuffie and even some work for the United States Postal Service on stamps featuring Spider-Man, Batman, and Calvin and Hobbes, Robert Granito appeared to have enjoyed an extremely successful career leading up to his rise to internet infamy in March of 2011. Soon, however, the apparently promising and accomplished young artist would find himself a literal pariah, barred from basically 
every major convention in the United States, universally despised and exposed as a complete and utter fraud in nearly every sense of the word. But just how did Granito manage to piss off so many people? What did he do that was so egregious? It warranted turning him into a living, breathing warning to anyone else that might be stupid enough to dare tread down the same path. Well, it's a strange and truth be told kind of sad story in some ways, but one that does warrant sharing for a few reasons in my opinion, none of which are to simply pile on or attack Robert Granito, by the way. Truth be told, this video isn't necessarily about Granito so much as it's about the situation that surrounded him and how people reacted to it all. A staple of conventions and live shows for more than a decade by the time our tale begins in 2011, a series of unfortunate events would catapult the young artist into the spotlight and make him the target of one of the largest and harshest comic shaming campaigns in recent memory. What's honestly crazy about this story though, especially how well known Grenado was and how long he'd been at it by the time this shit really hit the fan in 2011, is he had been operating with what seems to be near virtual impunity and zero fear of repercussions in his illegal business for as long as everyone could remember. No one was happy about what he was doing, but when it came to his public crucifixion, none of that mattered. Truth be told, I don't think what happened to him had so much to do with the fact that Granito was stealing art from people and passing it off as his own. He'd been doing that for years. Everyone knew who he was, and instead of taking him to task, they just simply shook their head and moved on. This isn't what led to his downfall. In the end, Robert Granito simply dropped the wrong name at the wrong time and was instantaneously engulfed in a scandal that seemed to galvanize the entire industry against him almost overnight. Like I said, it was the wrong name. Infuriated and having finally had it with the artist so many of them had suffered through sitting next to an artist's alley for years. Creators and fans alike joined forces to quite literally lay siege to Robert Greeno's life in March of 2011. It was seriously impressive how many people he upset and how badly he managed to upset them. It didn't seem to matter who you were, what kind of comics you liked, or even if you liked the people getting ripped off. In the immortal words of Mark Wade, quote, when you get comics loudest left-wing hippie freak and loudest right-wing Nazi to join forces on your ass, you have f***ed up. A rather unremarkable and uninteresting person himself, the name that burnt Granito's world to the ground and what exactly happened that sent people over the edge is actually a far more interesting tale than the story of a man who, by all appearances and accounts, simply didn't have the talent or drive to make it in the industry and took some unsavory shortcuts that should have caught up with him years before all of this. If it weren't for what happened to Robert Granito, the machinations at work that led to the entire story situation. If we were here to simply talk about Robert Granito stealing other people's art, this would be a short and boring video. Granito was just another guy shamelessly ripping off art from other creators. What's really interesting here is the fears that motivated some people to try and actually quiet the entire affair and how this was tied to the legal gray area that a lot of professional comic artists operate under at conventions where they offer technically unlicensed prints and commissions. But before we get too mired down in all of that, let's go back a few years and start at the beginning of our twisted little tale, shall we? I mean, this video is still technically about Robert Granito, after all. One of the strangest parts of this entire tale is the fact that while the downfall of Robert Granito would literally occur within the span of a few weeks, he had been operating for years inside and around the professional comic book industry, albeit in virtually none of the ways Granito claimed over the years. There was essentially nothing special or, in fact, unique whatsoever about Robert Granito, his so-called work, or the fact he was routinely ripping off other artists' work and selling it. What did somewhat set him apart was that while many people who sell these types of prints directly acknowledge where the art originated and are rather upfront about the fact it's not completely original, 
This was not the case for Robert Granito. For years, he had been taking off people claiming that everything at his booth was an original by himself. While this was enough to be irksome to many artists who take umbrage to their hard work being stolen and in turn used to not only make someone else a profit, but in this case, earn them something of a reputation as well. While I was never able to find exact details about when Granito began attending shows and conventions, multiple articles, interviews, and social media posts said that he had been attending attending involved in his illegal print and traced artwork racket for years, with at least two articles stating he had been at it for nearly 15 years by 2011. As I said, Granito is far from alone in his efforts to commandeer and profit off of other people's work, though prior to March of 2011, no one really thought it was worth pursuing legal action. He wasn't getting rich off the operation, but in my research it was clear he was definitely making a decent living doing what he was doing. However, as the years passed and Granito began to become more and more of a regular, there was a mounting sense of unease and hostility from a growing faction of professionals that obviously and rightfully resented what Granito was doing. One of the major precipitating factors in the growing hostility towards Granito that would soon explode stemmed from the fact that while he started out just like everyone else, plying his wares from the crowded, bustling aisles of the dreaded artist's alley, due to the quality of his work, or in fact, other people's work, he was claiming was his own, Granito began being given preferential treatment at a lot of the conventions he attended. And I'm not talking about little rinky-dink conventions either. The number one name that you see tossed around in articles and discussions of this period in Granito's career is Wizard World. Notorious for their rather ambiguous take on legal matters concerning characters, IPs, and the appropriation of art anyways, Wizard seems to have been an early, ongoing, and important fostering ground for Granito's antics. Considering some of the stuff he would say, I would like to say that being at conventions like Wizard World, surrounded by professionals of unimaginable status and accomplishment, Granito was simply struggling for attention, and that was the reason he began making such outlandish claims. I don't think this is the case, though. I actually found a few little interviews and pieces with him that preceded the public train wreck that became his life in 2011, and it appears that he had been making the same insane list of claims for several years with one seemingly small but all important thing missing, and more specifically, a single name. Before that though, and listed on his website and recited like he was reading back a cue card when asked about them, Granito made some truly fantastic claims, claims that had begun to cause his name to be the recurring subject of some debate at many of the conventions he was attending. Frustratingly, I think due to the legal implications of calling someone a fraud and a thief, things which I'm actually acutely aware of myself producing this documentary actually, as well as the fact at some point there was a line crossed, and this went from setting things right and getting justice to an absolute witch hunt. I know there were personal attacks, but for whatever reason, a great deal of the detective work and sleuthing done to uncover and reveal exactly what Granito had been up to prior to his public trial in 2011 has been entirely scrubbed from the internet. And I'm not talking about sites being inoperable at this point or anything either. I mean, the content has been expressly removed and made unavailable with the Wayback Machine. I legit didn't even know that was possible. Because of this, along with the fact that Granito literally began hastily disassembling his site the day he was outed on Bleeding Cool, and that he was quite literally no one before this story, he was just another nameless face peddling unlicensed prints to unwary or gullible convention attendees, there was absolutely nothing special about him. While it's unclear exactly when he started, as I said before, I managed to find a 2008 interview where the interviewer, Zen Box, stated he had previously spoken with Granito at the same convention several years earlier. When they originally spoke, Bach was impressed with his work and had complimented him at the time. He anxiously followed up with him when they subsequently 
subsequently ran into each other a few years later in 2008, and these references to their past conversations actually illuminate a little bit of what was going on prior to 2011. When they first met, Granito had described himself as a struggling artist who had been dealing with a lot of frustration and rejection. This is likely in reference to a series of Marvel masterpiece sketch cards he had been allowed to do, many of which were ultimately rejected and never used. Zinbach then asked Granito what he had been up to since they last spoke, and what followed is one of the most ludicrous lists I've ever come across. Only someone like Jeff Beckett Jr. would have brass balls like this. It takes a lot of chutzpah for someone like Robert Granito to sit in the same room as other actual professional comic book artists, the people who were responsible for creating the art he was selling in many cases and make some of the claims that he did. He'd obviously been working on it for a while, and his claims were no secret among fans, customers, or industry professionals, though. In fact, this resume would prove to be the undoing of Robert Granito, though not in the fashion one might expect. On the surface, it seemed like a particularly impressive list of professional accomplishments. In fact, once you started tugging at the end, though, the entire ball of string fell apart, exposing what was really at the center of this web of lies, a scared, insecure, and unremarkable artist who was doing whatever they could to try and garner attention, even if that meant lying about basically their entire life. By 2008, Granito was a convention regular, as I've stated, moving some serious product at places like Wizard World, where he was often a featured artist. He was in fact garnering enough attention by this point that Granito was being moved from the dingy artist alley into much more prominent positions than other actual industry professionals. While none of the other people who publicly went after Granito on any of the media outlets seemed to be motivated by this, I have no doubt that this had brought Granito into the sights of many artists that would quickly take an interest in his work following what was about to happen. Despite having described himself as a struggling artist that hadn't done much only a few short years before, when speaking with Zimbach in 2008, Granito provided an astounding list of stuff he'd been involved with, which were repeated in an official write-up from his site, which has since been entirely erased from the face of the internet, unfortunately, by the way. Granito made the following claims in 2008, however, quote, Robert Granito, internationally known artist and illustrator, has worked for 15 years in the genres of science fiction, fantasy, horror, and comic art. His name has been attached to major projects for companies such as Warner Brothers, DC, and Marvel Comics, Disney, MTV, and VH1, where he's worked on comics, graphic novels, trading cards, animation, as well as book, CD, magazine, and novel covers. Rob's recent work has been on Iron Man 2 for Marvel, Spider-Man Archives, and X-Men for Upper Deck, Marvel Masterpieces for Rittenhouse, and the playbill for the Broadway musical and posters for the 25th and 27th anniversary celebration of A Christmas Story. Never being one to ride on past successes, Rob is currently hard at work on projects for Noel, Lois Lane Neal, and Olympic snowboarding sensation Ross Powers, a CD project for music innovators Midnight Syndicate, the soon-to-be-released USPS comic strip stamps, and a project for a few classic comic strip cartoons. As if not fantastic enough for someone you've quite literally never heard of before, by 2010 things were getting very clearly out of hand. In an interview that year, Granito stated, quote, I started my career in the early 90s at the Warner Brothers Gallery as a picture framer and later on was given the chance to work for the studio on Batman the Animated Series Cells, the Animated Superman Series Painting Cells and Backgrounds. Afterwards, I was picked up for design work by MTV and VH1 through Viacom and headed from there to covers and graphic art illustration for Padwolf Publications, working on a slew of novels and comic covers. Recognized for his art skills, I was asked to teach for a year, but found that teaching and deadlines were hard to juggle all at once, so made the choice to leave his teaching career and continue painting, which gave him the opportunity to work on the novel The Dragon and the Detective, followed by Dragons and Wolves, that was published in the USA as well as Europe. 
This was followed by being asked to work on several stamps for the DC slash Marvel Heroes stamp series, which got me back into comics again working on Batman at first, then over to Iron Man and Spider-Man. Since the, I have worked on many projects from X-Men and Iron Man 2, as well as A Christmas Story and Calvin and Hobbes. And by the way, I apologize for the borderline illiteracy of his writing, but I just can't bring myself to fix it. It's like Jeff Beckett. His impaired grasp of the English language would not only come to be one of his calling cards, but also I think well illustrates the intellectual level of the individual that we're talking about here. If this weren't enough, Granito also claimed association with or having worked for people including but not limited to George Perez, Dick Ayers, Ty Templeton, Jay Dedillo, don't worry, I'll explain that name once we get there, Dan Jurgens, Brian Steelfreeze, and a host of others on big name Marvel and DC properties including Spider-Man, Iron Man, Teen Titans, and even Batman the Animated Series, Superman the Animated Series, and Batman Beyond directly under Bruce Timm. When confronted almost immediately about the fact that people couldn't seem to find his name in the credits for any of the books he was talking about, Granito explained this fact away as his work consisting mostly of uncredited ghost work done for more successful artists. Granito would explain that these much more famous artists would often take on more than they could handle and simply didn't have time to complete assignments oftentimes. That's when they would call Robert Granito. Granito would pencil or ink an issue for whoever, and then the artist would put their name on it. Granito would often be heard telling people that there was an entire world of people toiling behind the scenes that you honestly don't hear about. Which is true, just not necessarily in the way that Granito was telling it. Being the trusting people that most fans are, especially given the more and more prominent positioning and billing Granito was receiving at conventions, which seemed to back up his claims in a lot of ways, Many unsuspecting customers took him at his word. The problem was everything that was coming out of his mouth was a lie. Mind you, it all had a root in truth, but almost every lie does. For me, most astoundingly, Greeno was making these claims while surrounded by the very people he was talking about. While it was directly confirmed by every single artist that he mentioned aside from one whose assistant at the time denied it for him, Granito worked on none of the books he claimed. In fact, no one at Marvel or DC even knew who he was. Of all the wild stuff that he claimed, there's one credit that should make it abundantly clear just how full of crap Robert Granito was though. He claimed to have worked on a number of postage stamps for the United States Postal Service, specifically on Marvel, DC, and quote, Calvin and Hobbes stamps. Although admittedly he didn't even manage to spell Calvin correctly in that post, this is obviously the claims of a lunatic. If you are even vaguely familiar with Calvin and Hobbes, you'll no doubt be aware there's literally no official Calvin and Hobbes merchandise. This is because creator Bill Watterson refuses to compromise what he sees as his artistic integrity. That same integrity and attitude has resulted in something of particular note as far as his cartooning career goes here. Watterson insisted from the very beginning of the strip that he have almost complete and unfettered artistic control over the strip and that no one else be involved. This insistence on control is speculated as being one of the major things that motivated Bill Watterson to entirely avoid merchandising. That would require the art to pass through a secondary filter of some sort for preparation for whatever project it was intended for. This fact alone is enough to make Bill Watterson uncomfortable enough from some accounts that he entirely shot down any merchandising opportunities from day one. It's cost him millions in potential revenue, but on the few occasions where he's addressed the subject, Watterson could seem to absolutely care less. The idea that someone this fastidious and controlling of their work would outsource one of the handful of what even approached merchandise for that same property sounds extremely far-fetched to me. There was also the fact that Calvin and Hobbes was listed under recent work. Mind you, this was circa 2010-2011. Calvin and Hobbes had ceased publication with Watterson further withdrawing from the public eye nearly 15 years before this in 1995. While initially Granito would try to clarify that his Calvin and Hobbes work had been on the stamp and nothing else, 
even this was an utter falsity. There was basically no way that Granito was on the level about the Calvin and Hobbes stance. None of the people he mentioned even acknowledged knowing who he was at Marvel in DC, and I personally recognized many of the images that could be seen hanging in his booth at a cursory glance. I was floored when I came across someone flipping through Granito's book of art from an actual convention in a video on YouTube. There were Neil Adams pieces, Al Rizzo, Norm Bray Fogel, Ty Templeton, the list goes on and on. What's crazy is this video was taken a few days after the bleeding cool article that rocked Granito's world and united, if only for a brief moment, almost the entire comics community who pulled together so quickly and were so effective in exposing Robert Granito for the alleged fraud that he was, his years-long career in the industry would be entirely razed to the ground within a matter of eight weeks or so. The Bleeding Cool article was what started the ball rolling, got Granito's name out there, and really got people talking about him. Unsurprisingly, the article was inspired by one of the numerous and obviously untrue claims that Granito had continued to make about his career in the comics field when trying to sell prints to people. After all the insane jobs he said he'd had, all the names he dropped and the professionals that he claimed association with by extension, many of whom had seen him at conventions and knew full well he was full of crap. It was a single, incredulous customer who ended up bringing Robert Granito's carefully constructed house of cards down around his head, leading to his expedient expulsion from the comic community. As mentioned, one of the numerous claims that Granito was rather fond of making was having worked on Batman the Animated Series directly under Bruce Timm. After having purchased a piece of art for a somewhat inflated price given the provenance of Granito doing work for the series, a friend of Bleeding Cool's Rich Johnston discovered the Granito piece was a swipe and quickly began to suspect Granito might not have been on the level when he was discussing his alleged career in animation. Johnston discovered that Granito had in fact never worked on the series in any capacity whatsoever, let alone directly under or with Bruce Timm. This began a daisy chain effect. It turned out that a lot of people, especially given the show's connection to Harley Quinn and her rise in popularity at the time, had purchased Granito pieces under the guise of his having worked on the series and were not pleased. Intrigued more than anything and always interested in busting chops and getting their hands on a juicy gossip story, Johnson and Bleeding Cool reached out to Granito for comment. Because Granito initially didn't even bother to respond, probably not thinking much of the message when he got it, this precipitated Johnson's running the article asking if anyone knew who Rob Granito was or what he had been up to. As innocuously as it might have begun, once the article dropped, all hell literally broke loose. The altercation that followed brought together comic fans and professionals alike in a unified effort to hit take Granito out at any cost. The original Bleeding Cool article, Who is Rob Granito, was released, I believe, on March 24th of 2011. The original article was quickly updated as information began to pour in about Granito from all over the place. Once updated, the article laid out the absolutely unbelievable claims that Granito was known to make, publicly boasted about, and even put on his website. It appears that once this happened, Robert Granito almost immediately began to realize the gravity of the situation he was being pulled into. Like an absolute idiot, though, rather than just scrub his website and go underground for a while, Rob Granito instead quickly got back to Rich Johnston, but provided, shall we say, less than satisfactory answers regarding his claims of past employment and collaboration. This would be the first of several instances of Granito attempting to completely backpedal in an attempt to explain away his outlandish claims. Each time, Granito would entirely change his story and start basically every answer by explaining he simply hadn't thoroughly elaborated or thought about the questions enough to provide comprehensive answers, leaving out what seemed to him insignificant details. These details, however, were anything but insignificant. When he originally agreed to speak with Bleeding Cool following the Who Is Rob Granito article, he claimed at the time, quote, Yes, I am currently working with Jay Dedillo on a Batman title that has not yet been released. I've worked on dozens of books, The Shadow of the Bat being the Batman title I was on for about four weeks. Most of my work has been covers, though. Now, if you like me are wondering who the hell Jay Dedillo is, I'm going to say right now, I'm pretty sure Robert Granito was trying to lie about Dan DiDio. 
who was the co-publisher of DC along with Jim Lee while all of this was happening. It seems Johnson also put this together and asked Granito about it in what would become a shrinking opportunity to see just how full of crap Granito really was. Quote, Jay is one of the big writers for DC. I probably spelled his name right. Again, going to step out on a limb and assume that Granito meant he probably spelled Dan DiDio's name wrong? I swear, after having just covered Jeff Beckett Jr. and his insane decades-long bender across multiple companies and innumerable scams, I'm starting to feel like these guys all sound the same. They're these semi-literate individuals that can't put together a proper sentence on the page if their life depended on it. As far as his supposed Spider-Man, Iron Man, and Batman work, Granito was quick to clarify, quote, I did mix work, fill in work, and was a ghost artist for most of the projects, going on to claim that his, quote, covers range from the Shadow of the Bat issues 12 to 25, Teen Titans 1 to 7, and Spider-Man, then claiming, quote, I did a buttload of work for Spider-Man and Iron Man. Despite providing issue numbers for Shadow of the Bat and Teen Titans, Granito ended with a puzzling quote when directly asked about the Spider-Man and Iron Man issues he had worked on. Quote, I don't know the numbers. I mean, okay, I get if you've worked on a million books and not remembering stuff off the top of your head, but this was via email. And given how often Granito seemed to brag about this work, you would think he would be bothered to even look up the issues that he was claiming he'd done. That is, you know, if he'd actually done any issues of Spider-Man, or Iron Man, or Batman for that matter. As for the titles he was foolish enough to actually provide issue numbers for, the issues of Shadow of the Bat in question had all been covers done by Brian Steelfreeze. The Teen Titans issues had been done by Dan Jurgens and George Perez. I mean, I'm sure that Granito assumed that no one would bother to fact check what little info he did provide, and even if they did, no one was going to be able to just call up Brian Steelfreeze or Dan Jurgens, George Perez to ask them about it. Except that's exactly what Rich Johnson and Bleeding Cool did. Jurgens and Perez both quite directly stated there was zero ghost work going on to say that they didn't even know who Granito was. The question quickly became not what issues of what series he may have worked on, but if Granito had actually ever been employed by DC or Marvel at all. Things had gone from bad to worse for Granito in the span of less than 24 hours, and there's no doubt he knew it. He stopped responding to messages from Bleeding Cool, and if his poorly chosen answers caused him problems, leaving people to do their own detective work was even worse for Granito. Who is Rob Granito had attracted a good deal of attention even before Granito chose to respond to the allegations regarding his falsified work history with even more bizarre stories than the first ones. If he'd have just left well enough alone and disappeared for a while, he might have made it through all of this. Once he chose to engage, and his answers raised even more questions to which people were now beginning to become increasingly interested in discovering the answers to, it was game over, man. Even if he didn't know it yet, people were intrigued by the borderline absurdity of some of his responses, and people began to dig deeper and deeper into Granito's life and claims. Within 48 hours, it was revealed Granito was claiming to have been the man responsible for the Jim Lee Scott Williams Batman postage stamp, despite the two being quite publicly and directly credited for it. People had a laugh, but the hate that would soon come wasn't there yet. When other claims came to light, including when it was revealed that Granito had taken a scanned image of Calvin and Hobbes, flipped it, applied some ink and paint to the outer edges, and made it appear as an original illustration and then sold it as an original, having of course claimed to work on Calvin and Hobbes, people weren't laughing anymore. They were outraged. He was attacking their childhood. Granito wasn't just selling the unlicensed prints and appropriated images that so many other people at the comic conventions were. He was tracing, copying, and in a lot of cases, just taking scans of other people's art, printing it out, and then applying his own, quote, finishing touches to the already completed images. This happens all too often to comic creators, and there's not a week that goes by where I don't hear about someone trying to pull a stunt like this but not on this level, and certainly not involving Calvin and Hobbes, which is arguably one of the most popular and beloved comic strips of all time. Ironically, it seems like the Calvin and Hobbes angle drew people from outside of the comics community in strengthening numbers 
out to get him at this point and succeeded in galvanizing opinions about Granito all over. And this was all before he ever had a real chance to stick his foot in his mouth. Because trust me, if you think this is crazy, just wait. Within days of the Bleeding Cool article, after running the Who is Rob Granito article and accompanying Q&A, numerous other media outlets began picking up on the story and were beginning to attempt to have Granito permanently banned from conventions and appearances across the country. This initial wave of indignation was ignited mostly by the fact that Granito had claimed association with both Calvin and Hobbes, bringing in a host of people who otherwise probably could have cared less, and Bruce Timm claiming to have worked directly under him on Batman, Superman, and Batman Beyond animated series. Granito had used his supposed connection with the show to then suck around suspecting customers into purchasing prints associated with the show at inflated prices, usually Harley Quinn pieces, by either Ty Templeton or Bruce Timm. This first wave of backlash against Granito, however, would pale in comparison to what was to come next. While the initial attempts to have him removed from the convention circuit and mounting anger about his claims of work on both Batman the Animated Series and Calvin and Hobbes, Granito was still making appearances as if nothing had happened. In one video I saw, you can actually hear him complaining to someone else at his booth that he doesn't understand what people are so upset about. It's just some little kid talking. It's crazy. What the hell, man? I come here to fuck. Dude, I'm a freaking comic book artist. What the hell did I do? Did I rip somebody's kid or something I don't know about? This lack of understanding and situational awareness, along with his big mouth, was about to come back to bite Robert Granito in a big way. It just so happened that Granito's booth at that year's Megacon was only a few tables down from two legendary comic book creators and completely diametrically opposite human beings, Ethan Van Skyver and Mark Wade. While on the opposite ends of the spectrum from one another, both Wade and Van Skyver are well known for speaking their mind and having, uh, how shall I put it, extreme views to be polite. The two men are politically at odds. They see the industry in completely different ways. And while Comics Gate hadn't officially broken out by this time, to say there was no love lost between the two even then would be an understatement. I won't say they hate each other. But it was certainly a rare occasion the two were in the same room together under their own volition. The one thing that Wade and Van Skyver undeniably have in common, however, is a deep and abiding love of comic books. I don't always agree with what either one of them says, but they love comics, and that's never been in question for me. I can at least respect that no matter what else. I say one, but I suppose they actually had two things in common now that I think about it, though. This common ground would prove to be the ground zero for the next bizarre twist in our little tale tonight. And given how at odds the two were, no matter how much they loved the industry, what was about to happen almost defied belief. As the weekend began, it appeared to be rather uneventful for Robert Granito, who at this point I don't think was feeling the full backlash yet of what was coming due to the Bleeding Cool article and the story being picked up by innumerable media outlets plastering his name anywhere and everywhere on the internet during that weekend. Then something happened. As Ethan Van Skyver described it, quote, Towards the end of the day, Mark Hammond from the old FX show came by to hang out at my table. And some other kids, some asked me if I was working with Jay Dadillo, and I agreed that I'd like to, but I only knew him through a mutual acquaintance, Rob Granito. And that's when they told me he was actually here in Artist Alley. Made sure that Mark had a camera and I took him and a few witnesses to watch me confront Granito and to take pictures. Sure enough, there was Rob with a huge display of his now infamous swiped painting, all familiar by now because they're all over every comic-oriented website. Rob jumped out of his seat to shake my hand. Ethan, oh hi! I didn't shake his back, I just stood at his table, shook my head, and laughed. How's your day going, Granito? He chuckled nervously. The weirdest day of my life. Everyone wants to kill me. I don't know. What did I do? You don't know? I just want to understand, Rob. In what capacity did you work on Calvin and Hobbes? I don't get it. 
Meanwhile, some dude sitting next to him hopped up to support Rob's claim that people are all crazy and being rude, but it doesn't matter because they're still raking in the green. Rob's answer about Calvin and Hobbes was almost pleading. His lip trembled. He said, I drew the cancellation stamp for Batman and Calvin and Hobbes stamp. I didn't understand, so I asked him to explain. He said, you know, when a postal office stamps a stamp to cancel it, I drew that stamp. I was amazed. So you drew the stamp, and then I made the motion of someone stamping something, like a rejected stamp, and he nodded his head in furious agreement, pleased that I now understood. That's totally weird, dude. Not the way you've made it sound. His lip hung agape. Explain yourself, Rob. What's up with all of these swipes here? He said, well, it depends on what pieces you're looking at. He paged through three huge folders on his table. This isn't a swipe. No, but it was horrible. Yes, but that is, I said, pointing to the John Byrne plastic man painting that was hanging up. John Byrne drew that, but I wouldn't know it from the way you've presented it. It simply says Robert Cornito. Well, people know. No, they don't know, Rob. If you must swipe someone else's work, you must be very clear. It must say after John Byrne or something, you've got to credit the original artist with the entirety of the drawing. Rob got panicky and went through his folder again, pointing out a big print of George Perez's Superman cover with Thor's hammer and Captain America's shield. It said on the bottom in Typex, inspired by George Perez. He tapped it with his two fingers. I do, do, I do do that. Rob, that wasn't inspired by Perez, that was stolen from Perez. It's entirely his drawing, which you've traced. He shrugged and said, I don't know what to do, to which I instructed him that he must, if he should continue to do this, always make it clear on the paintings that they've been copied from other artists after George Perez. And even that isn't good enough because you've changed nothing. Tributing George Perez would be to draw the same image from a different angle or to change the character and keep the pose, but to sign it after George Perez. He agreed and became silent. I laughed and said that he was going to be a superstar of the comic book media for a long time, and I took a photo with him for my own amusement. It's been posted by Mark, I believe. Everyone laughed at him, and we all left. The end. This seemed to sate Van Skyver's appetite for destruction. However, that sensation was apparently very fleeting. Finally, by the end of the weekend, on the final day of Megacon, Van Skyver had finally reached a boiling point for one reason or another. I don't know that he ever publicly posted about it or that he's ever even acknowledged that it was the reason, but I can tell you at some point someone came up and told something to Ethan Van Skyver, something that sent him over the edge. Simply messing with him wasn't enough. There needed to be something said, and Van Scriver was going to do just that. One might wonder what it took to finally piss off Van Scriver enough that he left his own table, walked up to Mark Wade's, exchanged a few sparse words with the writer before Wade then stood up, and the two men made a direct beeline for Granito's table. Well, that's the linchpin of this entire tale, the fatal mistake that Granito made that I believe absolutely ruined him. While it had been Granito's claims of working on Batman the Animated Series that started to unravel his carefully constructed web of lies, or not so carefully constructed web of lies, I suppose I should say, Robert Granito still probably could have walked away. Comics can be a truly forgiving place, and even with his name everywhere for stealing art, even surrounded by the very people he was stealing it from, Granito had never been accosted or reprimanded at a show before Megacon that I'm aware of. Even when Ethan Van Scriver chided him, he, it wasn't like he threatened legal action, he was obviously having fun at Granito's expense. While admittedly more than a little bit pissed that he was stealing people's art, this though, what was about to happen, this made up for every show that Karma had missed him in the past very, very quickly. Thanks so much for sticking with me. I hope you all enjoyed, maybe you learned something. If you did enjoy what you saw, make sure you hit that like button. Think about getting in the comments section below and letting me know if you really enjoyed what you saw, make sure you Hulk smash the subscribe button. If you do that, make sure you ding the little notification bell so you never 
miss another video or premiere again. If you feel like you're in a position to help the channel grow, think about using the link in the description below to sign up for my Patreon page. For as little as $3 a month, you get access to tons of behind the scenes posts, updates, and exclusive content like uncut interviews. You can even get your name in the credits. If you want to support the channel, but Patreon is not your thing, have no fear. You can finally sign up for membership right here on YouTube. Just hit the little join button and make sure you select the tier and the perks that fit you best. If that's not enough, you can also make one-time donations towards specific goals or just hit the channel using the Ko-Fi link in the description below. You can even pick up your very own jerk comic shirts like the ones you see on the screen now. As always, this video was brought to you by the Jerk Broadcasting Service, as well as generous grants from the Patreon, Ko-Fi, and YouTube members you see on the screen now. I seriously want to thank every single one of you that supports the channel and helps make these videos possible. I really hope the quality and content is getting better, and I can't wait to see where this next year takes us with your continued support. I am going to make this what I do. Thank you all again for helping this crazy dream of mine become a reality and for sticking with me. I hope you all enjoyed, maybe even learned something. And as always, I really truly honestly ask only two things. Keep hitting those local shops and keep reading comics.